David Baker is the author of 11 books of poetry, including Scavenger Loop, his latest, and Never Ending Birds, which was awarded the Theater Rethke Memorial Poetry Prize. His five books of prose include Show Me Your Environment, Essays on Poetry, Poets, and Poems, and Radiant Liar, Essays on Lyric Poetry. Among his awards are prizes and grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Mellon Foundation, and the Society of Midland Authors. He holds the Thomas B. Fordham Chair of Creative Writing at Denison University in Granville, Ohio, and is poetry editor of the Kenyan Review. And by the way, for you strummers and jammers out there, in an essay uh, titled, Hum Along, How I Took Up Guitar and Became a Poet, David wrote that he owns a heritage super eagle custom with twin gold humbuckers, Grover tuners, a hand-carved Swedish spruce top, ebony bridge and board, split block, mother of pearl inlays on the curly maple neck, and a gorgeous blonde flame. I have no idea what all that stuff is, but doesn't it sound fabulous? <laughs> so, um, on to some thoughts about David's work. Professor Baker has spoken of the primacy of place in his sense of poetic vocation. I am a Midwestern poet, he says, and that groundedness invests his work, which is colored and shaped by the seasons, villages, and landscapes of Ohio. But the local offers an angle of vision, Emerson's phrase, into the large. The poems do not so much unfold as wend, coming to subjects as varied as suicide bombing, terminal illness, the revisionary processes of art, the human failure to abide with the dying. And then the poem returns, wends back to an informed, the poet returns, wends back to an informed, often shaken understanding of what, what's at hand, what's right here. An ivy plant that grows prolific from cuttings, a dying fawn whose soft leather nose lies nestled in his palm. Scavenger Loop, the stunning 30-page title poem of this new book, enacts this stitching together on a large scale the phrase scavenger loop refers to a natural process whereby the remains of animals who die in the wild are spread throughout an ecosystem, like a woods or a forest, by scavengers like worms, beetles, maggots, ravens, vultures, all those delightful creatures, so that the remains of the dead create the rich organic earth from which comes the next generation of animals, plants, and trees. This reality of death and renewal provides a powerful context in which the poet explores two sources of grief. The environmental damage, seemingly terminal, wrought by corporate farming, genetic manipulation, and pesticide use, and the illness, death, and burial of the poet's mother. The poem's subtle effects are achieved by David Baker's canny use of form, which, here as elsewhere, seems perfectly attuned to the work's ambitions. Scavenger Loop is an assemblage, let's call it a compost, of short, powerful lyrics, single sentences, and shards of speech, including quotations scavenged from ecologists, poets, philosophers, corporate and government websites, even that classic kids book, Good Night Moon. Remember that one? Yeah. Alice Fulton has spoken of David Baker's capacious ro rolling mind, and in Scavenger Loop, he has created a form wherein that mind can move unfettered. As a result, the poet allows us to experience the depth of two tragedies, one personal and inevitable, the other planetary and the result of human arrogance and greed, without easy equations or obvious polemics. I finished this long poem and then the book feeling both deeply moved and hopeful. Why hopeful? It seems to me if a poet like David Baker can create artistic forms, artistic forms that honor the complexity of our relationship to the green world, surely we can invent political forms that are capable of honoring that relationship as well. Let's welcome David Baker to Trinity College.
Hi guys. I usually don't say much, but just read. But I have a little thing to say, because I've been today getting on the little iPhone and reading about what happened in Oregon. You know about what happened in Oregon today? A single guy with a gun went to a college, killed a bunch of people, right? We don't even know how many, five, 10, 15 dead, it says. Did you hear about that? Community College south of Eugene, another one, right? Why do the inarticulate and violent go to schools to shoot people? Just answered my own question, didn't I? Where we go, lots of us, to try to be peaceful and sympathetic and work towards some kind of language beautifully, usefully, practically. That's what we do in places like this. So I appreciate you coming here on an afternoon when you could be doing something else to just sit and listen to a guy you don't know tell you stories. That's a pretty sweet thing. I love to do that. I like to sit right about there or there or there. I've gone to a million readings. I love them. But I just wanted to put that out there about today. And one of the reasons we come to rooms like this is so that we don't do that. Right? I'm going to read, I'm going to start with a little bit longer poem and a little bit older poem because I spent all afternoon with some classes here. I had a blast. I see some of you. I recognize some of you from classes. I had a really nice time with Claire's classes talking about writing poems and trying to write poems and what they're about and how we read them. And somebody asked something about writing vulnerability or writing about people maybe in your own family and what they may think of that. This is a poem about my daughter that I wrote when she was about 14 or 15. And it's okay with her if I read this. She has ADHD. And this was about kind of finding all that out and whatever. She's, I'm, I don't talk like this usually. <laughs> she is a little bitty girl. Her mother, my ex-wife, is also a poet. Imagine that. And, you know, she used to, we used to do readings and we'd read poems for her when she's like in the audience. She thought that was just very, very deeply cool. My mom is reading poems about me. My dad, she they was doing a reading once and she ran up and stood beside me while I read this poem and she waved at everybody. <laughs> then when she turned, I don't know, 10 or 12, holy cow. Do not mention my name. Do not look at me. Do not, because people will see me. And it was awful. But I could, we worked out this thing. It was okay still to write poems about her, and here was the rule she made up. I could do that, and I could read them in public, as long as she wasn't in the same county. <laughs> county. <coughs> I don't understand the calculus of that, but that was the, that was the arrangement that we made. So here it is. <coughs> This one's called Hyper. <clears throat> then a stillness descended the blue hills. I say stillness. There were three deer, then four. They crept down the old bean field, these four deer, for 15 minutes, more as we watched them in the field, in the sowing snow. That's how slowly they moved in stillness. Slender deer. The fourth limped behind the other three. We could see even in the darkness as it dragged its right hind quarter where it was hit or shot. Katie sat back on her heels. The dog held in his prince. 
Or Kate held him, hardly breathing at first. Then we relaxed. Blue night descended our neighbor's blown hills. And the calm that comes with seeing something beautiful but far from perfect descended. Absolute attention. A fixity. I say, absolute. It was stillness. In the books we gathered, the first theory holds that the condition's emergence is most common at age eight, if less in girls than boys, or more vividly seen in boys whose fidgets, whose deficit attentions, like little psychoeconomic realms, are prone to twitches turned to virulence, anxieties palpable in vocalized explosions, though now we know in girls it's only on the surface less severe which explains her months of bubbling tension, her long blue drifts and snowy distractions. I say distractions, of course, I mean how clinically tyrosone hydroxylase activity, the rate limiting enzyme in dopamine synthesis, disrupts, burns, then rewires her brain's chemical pathways. Let me put it another way. After 24 math problems, the 25th still baffles her. Pencil gnawed, eraser scuff shadows like black veins on her homework. It's not just the theory of division she no longer gets, it's her hot clothes, her itchy ear, the ruby-throated hummingbird's picture on the fridge. What's in the fridge? Whose socks these are? Why? Until I'm exhausted and yell again until she's gone away to her room, lights off to sulk, read, cry, draw. No longer trusting to memory, she writes everything in her journal now, then ties it with a broken strand of necklace. Of her friends, I am the funny one. Mom, she has red hair and freckles too. Under dad, I have his bad temper. I know. I looked. In one sketch she finished just before we learned what was wrong. I mean, before we learned what to call what was wrong, how to treat it, how to treat her, she captured her favorite cat with a skill that skips across my chest. He's on a throw rug, asleep, the rug's fringe ruffles just so. The measure of her love is visible in each delicate stroke. From his fetal repose, ears down, eyes sealed softly, paws curled inward. To the tiger lines of his coat, deepened by thick textures where she slightly rubbed away the contours with her thumb. To winter coat gray. He's soft, he's purring, He's utterly relaxed asleep. One day, before we learned what was wrong, she taped it to a pillow on my bed. Terry is tired, she printed at the top. How many ways do we measure things by what they're not? I say things, mostly her mind is going too fast. Yet the doctors give her, I'm not kidding, amphetamines. Speed, we used to say when we needed it. Ritalin, which wears off hard and often. Adderall, which lasts all day though her food's untouched and sleep comes late. The irony is the medicine slows her down. She pays attention, understands things. The theory is ADHD patients, ADHD patients aren't hyper-aroused, they're under-aroused. So they lurch and hurtle forward, hungry for focus. Another theory says the brain's two lobes are missized. Their currents lose their balance. One makes much of handedness, left, red hair, 
allergies, wan skin, an Irish past. We watched four deer in stillness walking there. Stillness, walking. Like the young blue deer, hurt but beautiful. In her theory of division, Katie started drawing them. Her renderings reduced them down to three. She has carefully lined the cut bean rows in contours like the dog's brushed coat. Snowflakes dot the winter paper. Two small deer stand alert on either side of the hurt one, leaning now to bite the season's dried up stems. Their ears are perched like hands, noses up, tails tufted in a hundred tiny pencil lines. She's been hunkered over her drawing pad, humming for an hour. So I watch. I say, watch. I ask why she's made the little hurt one so big. Silly. He's not hurt that bad, she says. She doesn't look up. That one's you. And there she is. I'm um, going to read a few poems from my new book called Scavenger Loop. The first is a simple little poem, I think, called Swift. But a bunch of people in classes were looking at this poem and we didn't have time to talk about it, so I think I'll just read it. Swifts are birds. They do this thing in my little village. I live in this tiny little town in Ohio of 3,000 people. And the birds do this thing every July and August. Swift into flight. The name as velocity. A swift is one of two or three hundred swirling over the post office smokestack. First, they rise come dusk to the high sky, flying from the ivy walls of the bank a few at a time, up from graveyard oaks and backyards, then more, tightening to orbit in a block-wide whirl above the village. Now they are a flock. Now we're holding hands. We're talking in whispers to our kind, who stroll in couples from the ice cream shop or bar bike here in small groups to see the birds. A voice in awe turns inward. As looking down into a canyon, the self grows small. The smaller swifts are larger for their singing. The spatter and shrill, the high cheap of it, and their quick bat-like alternating wings, and the soft pewter sky sets off the black checkmark bodies of the birds as they skitter like water toward a drain. Now one veers, dives, as if wing shot or worse out of the sky over the maw of the chimney, flailing, but then pulling out as another dips and the flock reverses its circling. They seem like leaves spinning in a storm, blown wild around us, and we are their witness. Witness the way they finish. The first one simply drops into the flu. Then four, five, in as many seconds, pulling out of the swirl, sweep down. So swiftly, we're alone. The sky is clear of everything but night. We are standing at a loss within it. These guys, they just, they live in the chimney. Hundreds of them, all night long. They live in the chimney, and nobody knows it. I stand there, I'm the geeky poet. I stand there in the corner, looking at the birds, and people walk by, what are you looking at? Look at the birds. And then somebody will stop, and they'll look, and they'll go, wow. They look like bats. They are the only bird, other than bats, that flies with an alternating wing instead of like that. So that's how you can tell they're swifts. I just think that's cool. So that was a kind of simple, just descriptive poem. This one is a hard one. It's about the same length. It's harder to hear. 
But the people in it, I think, are having some hard times, too. I don't think they're doing well. Magnolia. We were done for. Things broken. Things ugly. It being the shut end of night. Morning breaking. More like a bruise smeared through the wet few uppermost leaves. Not yet light so much as less dark. They shouldn't grow this far north. That's what the book says. What book? What I meant was each day begins in the dark. That's useless. That's too late. That's a pathetic thing to say. Older than bees, the magnolia. More primitive, the book says, whose carpels are extremely tough. They do not flower in sepals. They do not want such differentiation in their flower parts from which the term tepals. They open the anthers, splitting themselves out. That's your melodrama. No, no, they split at the front, facing the flower current. 16-something, Pierre Magnol, morning starting through them like a purple bruise, then a cloud as one small pale blue stretch mark, another, then another. That's not right. Flowers develop, develop to encourage pollination by beetles. Too early for bees grew tough to avoid damage by said beetles. There you have it. Magnolia Virginianii, subfamily Magnoliaidae of the family Magnoliaceae. Re relations have been puzzling taxonomists for a long time to survive ice ages, tectonic uptearing, slow drift of the continents, a distribution, scattered, things too old for change, mutinous in the half-light and malignant. Stop it, please. Please, they shouldn't be this far north. They bloom in a cup full of pink fire, each one lit by an old oil. Before us, the bees. Before us, the bees, the beetles, these trees. So what? We had walked out earlier, the porch, the terrible, dark, slow night. Their natural range, a disjunct dispersal, no light. The magnolia, the eye begins to see. Then the long, horrible scrape on its trunk, his single stretching pairing of the bark back. But he didn't finish his discomfort. His antler velvet, a cloud of sawdust and scrapings beneath like small remains of a cold fire, all night trying, then no longer trying. That's when we walked out. He must have run. I'm going to do something weird. I have a handout. <laughs> yeah. I tell you in Poetry Reading 101, don't bring a handout, but I have a handout because I have this story I want to tell you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Claire. I don't know if I have enough to go around. You may have to share. <laughs> I want to tell you a story. I'll get this handout around here because I want you to see something. I'm going to read it, a five-part poem. This will be on the final exam. <laughs> Do we have any more? I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. It's just something I want you to see that is in this poem. The poem I'm going to read is in this book, and some people have been reading this book. It's, the poem is called Five Odes on Absence. This is a poem about taking stuff out, about erasure or... There's a popular thing in poetry right now called erasure art, erasure poetry. You take some stuff and scratch out some letters and you, then you have a poem. Like, that's cool. And I, I kind of get that. That's interesting. Then it reminds me, you know, that's like Twitter. How many... How many uh, characters do we have? 140, exactly. No matter what we have to say, it's 140. So leave stuff out. This is a poem about leaving stuff out, making articulate attempts by leaving something out. Okay, that's story number one. Story number two is I'd been reading 
one of my favorite poets, this British romantic poet named John Clare. Anybody know John Clare? All the teachers know John Clare. Yeah. yeah. He's like the most beautiful lyric poet ever born. He's terrible. I mean, he never really quite wrote one completely done poem. And he wrote billions of them. I mean, Emily Dickinson, we all know Emily Dickinson, right? And we think, oh my God, she wrote a ton of poems. Emily Dickinson wrote 1,800 and some poems. Good Lord. John Clare wrote 3,000 poems. Big ones. Little ones. That's one story about John Clare. Another story about John Clare is he was terribly, terribly poverty-stricken. He's the poorest poet ever lived. Didn't bother him. He was happy. He was a gardener. He worked outside. That's fine. Wah, wah. I'll plant some flowers. That's good. He had a bunch of kids. It's not entirely clear how many kids he had. Six, eight, ten. Yeah, you know. Something like that. At some point in his life, he snapped. He went off. And he ended up in an asylum for years and years and years. And some people have this maybe good notion that this guy who loved the outdoors kind of snapped because the British passed something called the Enclosure Acts. They put fences around everything and partitioned it off and you couldn't just kind of go outside. You couldn't roam around freely anymore. So John Clare, he's in, he's in the institution for years. One day he decides to go home He's going to walk 80 miles. He walks 80 miles home. He eats grass on the way home because that's what he had. He wrote in a letter, it tastes like bread. And he got home to see his kids. Guess what? They were gone. Story of his life. He ends up back in the asylum. Well, here's what I wanted you to see. He wrote letters. In addition to writing 3,000 and some poems, he wrote letters. He wrote constant letters. There was one episode or one period in his life when he thought the doctors were reading his letters. So he was going to write code so the doctors couldn't figure out. They were reading his letters, actually, but, you know, whatever. He didn't want them. So here was his code. Ready? He took out all the vowels. <laughs> That'll throw them for a loop. They'll never figure that one out, he thought. So here's some of his letters. You see where it says three letters? The first one is the letter he didn't finish. You know, imagine his handwriting. It's very long and scrawly, and it goes from the bottom left to the top right. It's kind of beautiful, spidery letter. <coughs> this one he didn't finish. It just ended where he's writing some ladies' names down. We don't know who they were. Then he wrote another draft of this letter addressed to Mary Collingwood. We can't find out who Mary Collingwood was. She may have been somebody he was making up. I don't know. But here's the letter. See that one in the middle? Dear, my dearest Mary Collingwood, in code. I'm showing you this because on the back of this page, there are some lines from this letter that I use in the poem I'm going to read. And I'll show you kind of how it translates out into real language. And I'm going to read the real language. But it's going to be coded. It's going to be elliptical in in the poem. And just because I love it, I just stuck another letter on here too that John Clare wrote. This is the single saddest letter I've ever read in my life anywhere. I have no reason to show this to you except I want you to see this. This is this guy. I'm going to read this letter to you. <coughs> March 8, 1860. Dear Sir, I am in a madhouse and quite forget your name or who you are. You must excuse me for I have nothing to communicate or tell of and why I am shut up I don't know. I have nothing to say so I conclude. Yours respectfully, John Clare. Doesn't that break your heart? I don't know. It breaks my heart every day. He's go he doesn't know what he's doing, but he knows he's going to write this letter. I don't even know what I have to say. <sighs> anyway, long story. Here's the poem. Five Odes on Absence. It's about the little boy who lives next door to me, mostly. My dearest, 
he starts, I am nearly worn out. And if purple is the new black, as Vogue says, according to their latest ad by tweet, it is the season's thing, perhaps erasures our poetry du jour. At the Walker, contemporary poets have been composing astounding new work by removing portions of existing. Nobody will want me or have me, and what have I done? Join us as several guest poets read from and display their latest or landmark erasures, which means take Dickinson, rub some letters out, you can be famous too. Because I could not stop for death, make that be a cold sop. I stood at, you get the picture, Sappho, without time's injury. People tell me I have got no home in the world. <coughs> Part two. My neighbor's boy, Bernard, is practicing. Bang! Against his father's garage. Painted a week ago. Taupe siding and light brown sliding doors trimmed out and edged in white. Bang! And three dozen grackles scatter off the ornamental crab where they had lit. Beautiful tree to be so full of birds. Beautiful birds whose shape maintains a tree when they disperse. Silhouette widening like a flower blooms or limbs in blue flight. Bang! And his skates scrape down the concrete drive. He taps his stick, he digs his rollers in. Bernard's usually dead-eyed with a puck, but wild today. Black paint puff, one more scar on the door where he's missed the net once more. That's his father watching from the window. That's his mother, not there, not there, not there, not there. Three. Mr. Clare wants a little privacy. Who can blame him? Is 1849, all his life he's tried to get the words right. These are some lines of his that he scratched out and changed. The startled stock doves whizzing, the startled stock doves hurrying by, and the still hawk hangs over him, hangs over the sky in dusk, crows from the oak trees quacking as they, crows from the oak trees quacking as they spring. Get the birds right. Get the trees. It's not code, exactly. Now he's the talkative inmate patient of Northampton County General Lunatic Asylum. And now he's boxed with gypsies, written Don Juan, lived on grass, one mad escape home, and yet there art not there. And now he writes to Mary Collingwood, is she Mary Boland, is she Patty, dearest Mary. Are you faithful, or do you think of me? Pulling out the vowels. You did visit me in hell, leaving out the wise some time back. Foolish people tell me I have got no home in the world. Who can blame him? He gets confused, weaving it this way. Is faded all a thought? Is faded all a hope? He lived in a house with seven children. Where are they? He was the rage of London, peasant, poet, friend of... Where are they? Some days now he pulls weeds to keep busy, though his doctors want him inside, enclosed for safety's sake. He sings them little songs. I am, yet what I am, none cares or knows. My friends forsake me like a memory lost. I am the self-consumer of my woes. 3,000 plus poems in a lifetime. Not code exactly. Not exactly not. But don't come here again for it is a notorious bad place. Yours forever and ever and ever. John Clare. 
form. Mirandi paints a bottle by painting everything around the bottle, but not the bottle. This is how it always is. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. Twittering, birdsong, tremble, high-pitched laughter, state of great agitation, quiver, I feel I am, I only know I am, and plod upon the earth as dull and void. The key word is verisimilitude. It's not enough to tell the truth, you have to tell it in believable fashion. Then buyers won't care what you omit. Earth's prison chilled my body with its dram of dullness and my soaring thoughts destroyed. Twittering is writing messages of 140 characters or less, no matter the message, using copyright Twitter. These are live updates of what one's doing. I fled to solitudes from passion's dream, but now I only know I am. That's all. Final section, five. Some days, Isaac sits on the deck all day. He holds his head. He drinks a lot. He weeps. The birds are landing, black, then purple as the sun picks up the oils on their wings. The heavy crab grows heavier with them. The pink blossoms grow shivery like wings. I understand the patience. Sometimes I do. I wonder what Bernard sees when he sees the open net yawning there. Toward the end, Mirandi painted fewer lines, bigger ghosts made an edge with a sketch of edges behind the pale line of each edge. That's all it takes in your window of a thing. Bang! The way now the grackles explode out again in a crazy puff of wings. Bernard's rage is the hard pink downfall of petals there, or not there, as he skates back down the drive. I sit with my magazines, and cell phone. I feel crazy drifting by myself. Sometimes I think the birds are shadows of some other thing. I just can't see it well. Black, then purple, then purple turning black. You get the picture. On a better day, Claire writes, the starnells darken down the sky. But that's the price of time's erasure, too sad memories of a happy life. People make such mistakes. It isn't code. Where are? Then what he doesn't write is you. Is that rain out there? Beautiful scent. It's not rain. Uh oh, my hearing things again. Here's a little one. I think I'll read a couple of poems about my daughter. Again, she's not here. She's 23. I mean. You guys are just about that age, so, and it freaks me out. I miss her. She's in Shanghai, China. She's really far away. I can't get to her quickly. That bothers me. She's fine with that. She's happy about that. I miss her. This is a little poem called Never Ending Birds from a book called Never Ending Birds. And I mention that because that's her phrase. It was October. Many years ago, she was maybe three or four years old. We're driving down a little highway in Ohio on one of those days, if you've ever been to the Midwest, the sky is huge and clear, and there's a bird. And then there's a bunch of them. And then there are gazillions of them for a long time. You know those birds? We live under a flyway there. And we're driving. She's strapped into her little, you know, immobilizing child seat in the back seat, and we hear this voice say, look, there go the never-ending birds. Like, wow. 
It's just one of those phrases. Every family, you know, you've got two or three phrases that that one stuck. We said it all the time. We didn't even know what we were talking. It's never ending birds. Everybody goes, yeah, never ending birds. So years later, I wrote the poem about that, and I asked her if I could use that title. She just goes, sure. Then I asked her, can I call that phrase, because it was her phrase, the title of this book. She's like, yeah. So she's like 15 now. 10. And she says, by the way, Dad, do I get a cut? <laughs> I say, by the way, Katie, it's poetry. <laughs> cut <laughs> of help me out with that and she's like oh yeah that's right anyway this is for her never ending birds that's us pointing to the clouds those are clouds of birds now we see one whole cloud of birds there we are pointing out the car windows October gray blue white oleo of birds never ending birds you called the first time. Years we say it, the three of us, any two of us, one of those just endearments, apt clarities, kiss on the lips of hope. I have another house. Now you have two. That's us pointing with our delible worlds into the far away the true-born, blue, white, unfeathering cloud of another year, another sheet of their never-ending. There's your mother, wetting back your wild curl. I'm your father. That's us three pointing up. Dear girl, they will not, it's we who do, end. I think I'll just read like two or three more. If you can make it, we got time? You can do that? Okay. Because there's another one I want to read about her. <laughs> I'm sorry, that wasn't the plan, but that's just happening. Can you tell I miss her? Okay, another story. How do I tell this one? I think this may be the luckiest thing that ever happened to me in my life. How's that for raised expectations? That's what this poem is about. I live in this little village where the school district decided many, many years ago on Wednesday we're going to do something called Late Arrival Day. So instead of the school beginning at 8 o'clock, it begins at 9 o'clock. Every Wednesday, kids are just like, that's great! And so when she turned junior high age, what's that, like 14, 13, 14? My daughter, who's got five, her five girlfriends are the best friends. I think they were born in one egg. I, they're just very, very close. They're very, they're dear to each other. They're dear friends. They decided, okay, late arrival day on Wednesdays, what we're going to do, because we are now big, since we go to junior high, we're going to the coffee shop every Wednesday. And we're going to have breakfast together like the grown-ups do. And the parents were like, okay, that's cool. And I'm the parent of all their parents who had a job that could be flexible about everybody else started work at 8 o'clock I could start whenever I wanted if I just figured out my semester that way so the parents drop off the girls at the coffee shop at 8 o'clock and I stay and I have coffee with my daughter and her five best friends every Wednesday for years and it was the most surreal I mean, imagine a bunch of 15-year-old girls drinking coffee for the first time. It's like, Wah! you know, and I'm, I'm holding, you know, they talk about everything. I'm holding the paper trying not to just break into tears and laughter and whatever. Like, I know all kinds of stuff now. <laughs> like, um, okay, here's one for you. How many holes in your ears? Too many. Seven. I know that. After long debate, seven. Six is okay. Five is great, eight, slutty. <laughs> That's just bad. That's, we draw a line right there. Here's another one. Is cheerleading an actual sport? Nope. No, it's not. We talked about this for a, lot, a long time, and one of the girls, Sarah, was the head cheerleader of her squad and decided, no, it's not a sport. Hmm. Just endlessly. And then it, like, Anyway, that's what this poem is about. So here was the agreement. This is my daughter again. I can write this story and I can t 
talk about the girls, but I have to use each one's name because they thought they were going to be, ready? Famous. <laughs> so all the girls are in this poem. <laughs> Homecoming. Black coffee for Amanda, sipping the white steam. Jessica says, we have to hurry or the good dresses will be gone. No homecoming for you. She's got a sticky bun, cinnamon, enough caramel icing for a bunt cake, grape juice, and so does Sarah, who's doing social studies last minute in loopy green ink in her Beyonce ring binder. <laughs> Big girls, they're 14, they're fresh women, and with my Kate meet each Wednesday at 8 at the Daily Grind, late arrival day at high school. I'm the dad. My task is to load them at 8.50 back into my truck, windows down, music up, and drop them off by 9. Natalie's got her field hockey uniform on already, stretchy blue knee socks, plaid skirt, white under armor, shorts, insignia duffel, big as a body bag, with her stick, more pads, water bottles, school color scrunchies. Who knows? the other man in the shops reading a tabloid. Why doesn't the world love the U.S.? The girls know. We're stupid. We start wars. We have too much stuff. And then they're off on the Odyssey, the real one, for English reports. Each girl's got five minutes and a tale to tell. Homecoming, again, and the hero's loyal hound. The sirens, they're like the Vila in Harry Potter. Half-blood prince, no, 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 duh, says Katie, goblet of fire. Only nicer, they're so not nice, Morgan whiffs. But what about the loom? Oh my God, Sarah. Why does Penelope keep knitting if he's not coming home? It's freaky, why untie all that stuff? Honey. He comes home. Sarah. <laughs> By now, I don't know. I just don't know, girls. Then another mom walks by and gives me that look. I'm hot. I'm the dad. Then Hollis says, gee, Morgan's moody today. Kiss, kiss. Thus they set sail. I'll end with two brand new poems that I've never read before. Short one. No, you know, yeah, yeah. Little one. Peril Sonnet. Where do you suppose they've gone? the bees, now that we don't see them anymore. Four-winged among flowers, low sparks in the clover, even at nightfall. Are they fanning? Have they gone another place, blued with pollen, stuck to their bristles, waiting beyond us? Spring dwindle is what we call it collapsing neonicotinoids, high level in pneumatic corn exhaust, loss of habitat or disappearing disease in the way of our kind, so to speak. What do you think they would call it? Language older than our ears. Were they saying it all along, even at daybreak? One more. Students in Claire's class have been reading this long, monstrous poem I've written about my mother and her death. And I have been this past few months writing about my father, who's 89 and not well. 
and I go back and forth between home and Ohio and to see him and help him. He fell. I went to a conference. I was at a conference doing stuff, reading papers, phone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know when the phone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning, that's not going to be a good phone call. It was my brother, dad fell. I mean, we fall down all the time, but if you're 89, that's a perilous thing. Why not say what happened? This terrible breaking, this blow, then slow, the dogwood strewn like tissue along the black road. No, the busy pollinators, the breeze in the pine shadows in the aftermath where I drove back there, and two bones of smoke lifting ahead along the shoulder in the high new green weed bank running beside the asphalt. No, I had come from my father. Nothing more common, nothing more than such. I could not breathe for the longest time, over and again. There was something deadly, she said, in it of the genus Butio, as B. Harlani, as Harlan's red tail. Blocky in shape, says the book, blood or brick red, but white, I am sure, underneath, white along its wing, which was not smoke, but rising now, one bird. I was coming back and couldn't breathe, and him, bruised, torn, bedridden, tubed, taken to the brink by his body and carried aloft. There he had fallen. This is what happened, said the medical team. Fallen. And ripped aortal stenosis in the process of their repair. No. The big bird strained as trying to lift to a slight dihedral, the deepest deliberate wing beats, and barely above the, the snow-white-lipped grasses and the shoulder, until I thought I would hit it. It happened, or it did not, in my way of thinking. And now, why, I saw two lengths of snake, helical and alive in the talons, heavy there, writhing so the big bird strained for the length of time that it takes. Like the oiled inner organs of a live thing, heaving there in shreds. The dogwoods, the doctors, and did I say the horrible winds all before? Now the air after storm, the old road, empty, swept white, by blossoms, by headlights, my father hovering still, why it flew so close, why it was so terribly slow. I think I hoped it would tear me to pieces, lift me of my genus helpless as wretched and drop me away. I turned back to the animal. No, it turned its back to me. So, thank you for coming and for your attention. Thank you, everybody. So, I think we have time for maybe one question, and then the poet will hang around afterwards. David will sign books. Books? Um, Product. So, any, any questions? Even have to be a brilliant question, ordinary common question. Yeah, that's my guy. Do uh, what's your like favorite method of composition? Panic. I guess if you like start by like just writing down any ideas you might have, but is there? A, a I I, I, I know now to write them down than rather than try to remember them. I get an idea and I think I I write that down in about an hour. Then I write it down. It's just like um, the rain fell. <laughs> write stuff down. I've written on my arm, I've written on shirts, I've written on maps, I've written on everything. I don't write quickly. I'm slow and inarticulate and dim-witted. It takes me a long time. I just write notes. I get an idea for a poem and I don't write the poem. I write things like, I want this poem to sound like an oboe. Here's some phrases. 
I'm going to do a little research. Here's what it says, like in the poem I read, here's what it says in the Audubon book about the red-tailed hawk. I just take notes and notes and notes, but I don't write the poem. Then I get an idea for another poem, and I take notes and notes and notes and notes, and I don't write the poem. And then when I have notes for three or four poems, I sit down and write one poem and put the stuff together, which is just a fancy way of d defining metaphor. That's how I do it. Patiently. Over and over and over. Anybody else? Yes? I have a 24-year-old daughter, and the, the scene in the coffee shop is Been there? spot on. <laughs> I, was, I, I miss her too. Yeah, I mean, it, honest it's to God, was the luckiest thing that ever voice happened. Voice and humor, it was, I felt that was... I got to do that for years. You know, when I was told I was not allowed to go to the coffee shop anymore, when three of them got their licenses. <laughs> because in Ohio, a 16-year-old kid can drive around in a car with one other kid in the car, but no, long, no more than one. So it took three of them to be able to drive the six of them around. At, on that day, I was informed, Dad, you're not going there anymore. And so I'd go by, you know, I'd like walk by the window and, oh, 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 you know, they'd wave and they'd be like, eh. Yeah, we do what we do. <laughs> yes? Um, when you were reading, uh, you have this excellent sense of your own voice that I, that I think you very beautifully put into your poetry. Um, and it comes across very, very, uh, very smoothly as if from your own speech. Like, like you, you don't feel like it's a poem. you're reciting something. It's very, uh, you know, well, when, when you're performing. But, um, when you sit down to write a poem, do you think of it in a lot of terms of meter? Most of the poems I read are syllabic. They're metrical. You don't need to know that out loud. A poem out loud can do different things than it can on the page. I let them do different things. They have different virtues. That's terrific. I don't know what I sound like. I don't know what I do. My daughter tells me I wiggle too much. I will not watch tapes of me reading because I would, I would just never do it again because it would be so awful. Um, I, I don't know. I write poems because a poem can be a very physically embodied piece of language. It's not just something floating around out there. Somebody has a thing they want to tell you. They have a song to sing and it comes from one person, from a body, and this body is trying to express a thing. And poems can dance, they can sing, they can be or Tory, they can do all these other art things. And I think about that when I write. And I don't so much think about it when I read, but I try to make the language felt. That's all. And I don't like when people read and wiggle around and, you know, like, I'm going to read you a poem. You know, I'm like, oh, ee. And I, I worry that I do that, but I don't know. That was a non-answer. It was an, there was one other hand, and then maybe we should stop and eat food. Maybe there wasn't. All right. Well, okay, again, thanks, thanks everybody. Bye.